everyone has the foresight at a young age to know who British philosopher Alan Wells is and to heed his advice when planning their future. But our guest did, and maybe that's why he is the brand ambassador of one of the most profitable whiskeys in the world. I'm Susan Schwartz, your drinking companion, and this is Lush Life Podcast. Every week, we are inspired to live life one cocktail at a time by everyone in this industry. My guest, John Waite, UK brand ambassador of Monkey Shoulder, may have studied philosophy at university, but he wasn't quite sure he would emerge as a philosopher. He spent more time organizing parties and ski trips for his fellow students than definitely pouring over Plato. He did have the wherewithal to look at the future before him and deduce that serving alcohol linked everything he was doing. That led him straight into a career in the booze industry and he hasn't looked back. Now with the enviable position of brand ambassador to the massively successful Monkey Shoulder, a whiskey that prides itself on being as much fun as the whiskey inside of it is fabulous, he is right where he dreamed he could be. Before we begin, you can find links on how to donate to some of your favorite bars or have cocktails delivered right to your door during this rough time on the homepage of my website, alushlifemanual.com. Now let's philosophize with John. Uh, so I grew up uh, near Luton, uh, famous for our wonderful airport. Um, not really, uh, but uh, yeah, just out in the countryside. Uh, I went to school near there. I, I did a lot of. I used to do a lot of sports. Uh, used to, uh, where'd, you, where'd you play? Uh, all sorts, pretty much everything. Uh, quite a lot of rugby. I was really into running. Uh, it was a weird one because I was quite good at running, but I didn't really enjoy it. Um, but I used to think I wanted to be like a an athlete or a, an Olympian. I think you know I got carried away watching TV and things. Um, and uh, but I, I quickly discovered that I didn't have anything like the sort of natural talent or discipline to you know actually pursue those those dreams. You pursued other dreams. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. So, what did you do? Like, did you, were you planning on trying to go to university? Did you, you know that kind of stuff? Yeah. So, um, so as yeah, as I went on through like school and things. Um, I I was quite creative. I uh, used to really like art and maths and, and things like this. And uh, I thought I wanted to be an architect. Uh, so that was that was like the big vision. And I did like work experience at sort of architect offices and things. And um, I looked around universities with that in mind. Um, and then at the the eleventh hour, uh, which is kind of quite typical of me. I had a complete U-turn where I decided that I wasn't totally convinced I wanted to spend seven years training to be an architect, and so I should go study something else. Um, and um, in fact, I wasn't even really convinced I wanted to go to university. I was just like, my parents kind of told me I really should. Um, and they were like, whatever you do, just go to university. Then you can go do creative things if you want to, but uh, you always have like a degree to fall back on. And uh, so I went with uh, this uh, my other A level subject, which was philosophy, um, mm-hmm. and decided to study that at Leeds. Uh, I pretty much I picked Leeds mainly because it sounded like the most fun university there was. Um, and I thought, you know, if I'm going to have to go spend three years, uh, you know, studying something, it may as well be somewhere that was super fun. What What was fun about it, or what did you hear was fun about it? I just like my 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 sister. I've got brothers and sisters, and my my sister uh, went to Sheffield, and um, she's like ten years older than me. But I'd always I remember when she was going um, that she, it was sort of known as this sort of like party place, uh, <laughs> and I thought, well, <laughs> what better place to be then? Um, right, exactly. Exactly. So the part the party <laughs> aspect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, I, so uh, was was it was it the party place that you thought it would be? Oh well, yeah. I I did very little, um, very little like going to lectures and things. Uh, Philosophizing. Which, exactly, which is something I kind of actually regret a little bit now. I feel like I I, sh- I should have done, but at the time, um, 
yeah, it was, there, there's so many like societies and projects and events to get involved in. And like, I much preferred all those elements of university life or the sort of extra stuff you could do than the actual, you know, going and learning about, about philosophy. Um, but it, yeah, it's, 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 it was a funny process going through all that because then you come out of the end and you've got this degree in something which you hadn't really thought ahead. Uh, and because I, I quickly come to learn that, you know, you can't go become a Greek philosopher and sit under no. a tree and catch apples and things like that. So Especially if you're not Greek. <laughs> exactly. Right. So unfortunately, there's no money in that anymore. There used to be a lot of money in being a philosopher, but uh, not so much anymore. So... So I had to take a sort of different turn, um, which I guess is how I guess is how it sort of led me into into the drinks industry. But were you? Um, were th- I'm sure you were drinking. Obviously, it was a party school. Was there anything? Did you had you worked in a pub, or was there anything that may have ticked off that that might be the way you're going to go? So I used to run a lot of um student nights and host a lot of parties and um in in clubs and things like that so i was always around clubs and bars uh i used to be part of a ski club where we used to take like 600 students skiing every year and we'd have to sort of plan out those those trips and all the sort of social elements that would come with it um so while I wasn't actually working in a in a bar at the time. Uh, I guess I was always around certain bars and clubs, uh, which sort of exposed me to all those parts of of what is now kind of very similar to what I do in my job. So, how did you progress to working in this industry? So, I what st- straight out of university, I kicked off working for a small PR company. Uh, I kind of just landed in it uh by accident um and i quickly discovered that after about six months that pr wasn't really for me so i thought okay i should actually put some thought into this rather than just go with whatever lands on on my plate um so um i kind of had a bit of self-reflection and and time to think and uh there's there's there was quite a uh potentially cheesy video um that i remember watching a lot um and it's actually it's by a it's a little clip from a lecture by a philosopher called alan watts and the the premise of the video is um what what would you do if money was no object uh and it's basically him talking to his students and uh asking them to think about you know going after their like dreams or passions and that they can actually then turn that into a career uh, rather than just following like cash which which can be a different different route um so i remember reflecting on this and thinking well what do i really love doing i really love hosting parties and throwing events or organizing holidays and trips with my friends and things like that and i thought you know what is the sort of common denominator here uh and realized that you know, there was always alcohol. Um, and I thought, you know, it would be great to go and be able to facilitate those sort of things through the alcohol industry. So essentially, I guess I loved trying to make other people have a good time and to um, essentially make people happy for the want of a better word. Um, and so I thought, you know, if I could work in the alcohol industry, then I could continue to do things like that on a sort of permanent basis. That's, that's fantastic. Exactly. Um, so how did you find out what the first step would be to that? Well, I sort of just took a sort of, uh, like kind of, I don't know, rapid fire approach to applying to things. I applied to pretty much everything under the sun. Um, anything that's, uh, like loosely linked to alcohol, uh, at the same time, I had quite a lot of pressure from like my family and my like peers. They were all going off to do like graduate schemes and, and things like this. And I was thinking, you know, that is, I want to work in alcohol, but you know, 
that is what my parents will think is like a good step and things. Um, so I was sort of looking around um, and I came across this um, kind of program that had just been set up uh, by Shivers Brothers, which is part of Perna Ricard. Um, and the really interesting thing about this was that they didn't, they, they wanted you to have a degree, but they didn't care what level the degree was at, uh, which was quite important for me because, as I mentioned, I spent most of my time like, throwing parties <laughs> rather than studying. Uh, so my credentials <laughs> weren't too strong. Um, but I, um, but what they did ask for was a, an application video. And I thought this was like awesome because I was like, finally, I've been applying to all sorts of things, keep getting told no, no one can see who I am or what I do or how passionate I might be. But suddenly I've got this opportunity to kind of display this. Um, and fortunately, uh, because I, in typical me fashion, I only discovered that the application process was even open, I think a day before the deadline. Oh, Fortunately, boy. I had this like experience of making videos and films while, while I was part of these clubs at university. I was like, okay, if I keep it simple, I'll be able to do it in time. So I remember just spending like that Sunday, just sort of writing a script, sort of filming a very basic video, sending it in. And then fortunately, I was lucky enough to get an interview. And I think I've sort of taken that that sort of video mechanic forward to applying to all sorts of jobs uh, ever since. Um, and it seems to have really unlocked or opened doors um, because suddenly, one, you know, particularly when they don't ask for it, you know, they they get an opportunity to see you but also it shows a lot of effort and things like that and people like those sort of elements when when you apply for roles but um but yeah back when i applied to shivers it was it was all rather uh yeah just fortunate it was kind of quite lucky i went through their sort of application process initially they i didn't get the the job itself um they were at the time looking to hire something like 25 uh ambassadors or uh, I think like kind of sort of junior ambassadors to send to different countries around the world. And uh, everyone at the application interview process were all like linguists. They spoke Spanish, French, Chinese, Russian, all sorts of things. And there I was just with English, which they all had. So that obviously <laughs> lowered my odds. Um, but fortunately, like um, they called me up out of the blue and were like, so we've actually just had an opening come up in Poland. Uh, would you be interested in in interviewing for that? And um, I'd never even considered moving to Poland. Um, but, yeah, I, I instantly, just on the phone in the excitement, was like, yeah, sure, definitely. Um, and then two minutes after putting the phone down, there I am on YouTube, like, trying to check out what Poland's all about. Um, and, yeah as luck would have it managed to get get the role and and only a few months later i was flying out to poland a place i'd never been in my entire life uh to go and do a job i guess i didn't really know too much about at the time in a place where i can't speak the language so yeah it was quite bizarre but uh it set me on set me on this path trial by fire now i have a question did you ever think of going behind the bar and trying your hand at bartending in those times so, like, I guess I, I've often looked back and thought, you know, um, I really should have, uh, or you know, it, it would probably really help my my current role and things like that. Um, but I feel like I sort of, to some extent, I kind of missed the opportunity. Um, so while I was studying, it's quite fortunate that I didn't I didn't need to, or it just didn't sort of come up as something that I was going to do. Um, and then after that, I was just quite lucky to get into this, this role uh, with Pernod Ricard. Um, and then I found myself out in Poland talking about Shivers Regal. Um, I didn't actually need to know that much about cocktails at the time, because in Poland, it, 
they drank whiskey neat. Um, it was more about sort of knowing the history, knowing the process, knowing how it was made, um, all of which we'd had like very comprehensive training on. Um, wait, then, now, wait, before you go into that, yeah. hold on. So, so you get this job and you're sent to Poland. Did you, do you, so you had some training before that in, in London about what yeah. you were going to do? So the, and, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Sorry, right, inter, internet. Go ahead. I just chat fast. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so we, we had five weeks, uh, of training where we spent, uh, like one week with their marketing team, learning all about the different brands they had. One week up in Scotland, learning all about the whiskies. At the time, I didn't even particularly like whiskey. Uh, in fact, very few of the people they'd hired did. Uh, but the majority of us were going to be whiskey ambassadors. There were a few gin ambassadors, but the majority were going to be whiskey ambassadors. And um, I, uh, I, I remember. <laughs> after this week in Scotland, because we're basically doing a, a full flight of uh, whiskies every day and a tasting as they were talking to us about Chivas Regal or Ballantines or Glenlivet. And, and by the end of the week, you loved whiskey. Like you just got, you'd acquired that taste for it. You know how they say, you know, if you have something 16 days in a row or something, you, you, you like it. Uh, I think that they, they really took that mantra and applied it. Um, and yeah, then we had various other like public speaking training and uh, a, li a little bit on cocktails with one of their ambassadors. Uh, and then it was sort of just thrown out there um, into the wind and um, to see where you'd land. Um, did you, in those five weeks, did you think, yeah, I'm in the right place? This, I think this is going to be right? Or were you like, no, and I'm not sure yet? I, I think looking, looking back, it's... Um, I remember thinking it was, it, I was, it was super fun. We, we were with 20 people who were all like similar sort of ages to us, many of which are still some of my like best friends to today. Um, and you were like living together for, uh, for all this time. Um, and the alcohol industry seemed to just be super fun. So like there's so much energy, um, the, obviously, we see it all the time when we go to bars and stuff, but um, people often don't meet people who work uh, behind the scenes on brands. But I remember at Perno, there was like this real f feeling of f like family and togetherness and like work hard, play hard sort of attitude and things. Um, and yeah, just experiencing all that, I was I was buzzing, buzzing to go. But at the same time, I was kind of totally unaware of what I was actually going to be doing. Uh, they And I don't think they even really knew themselves. So you get to Poland. And what were you with another person or just you alone? Just me. Um, I was very relieved when I landed in the airport to discover they had like those moving carpets, which, you know, <laughs> might, might, might sound like a really bad thing to say <laughs> but I, I i had no idea what to expect and it wasn't that long ago <laughs> i know i know but like i had no idea what to expect i'd never been and when i saw i was like okay it's basically exactly like the uk it's, just, it's not as if language. you're like it's not as if you're like 80 years old and you're this like your first show. it's like only a few years ago <laughs> yeah i know i love that, I love that. all uh, right so you found they had yeah. moving walkways that yeah, you know people I, tv next, electricity etc and bars yeah. right bars oh, yeah. where, were you, where were you where yeah, were good. you uh where, where were you based so I, uh i was in warsaw you were. Um, uh -huh. and Warsaw is, I think, one of the most un, like, one of the best uncovered gems there is. Like, it's there's this when people think about going to Poland on a holiday or something, they like naturally gravitate to uh, Krakow, and yeah. it's the pretty Krakow, places, super pretty, yeah. picturesque, beautiful. Um, and in fact, Warsaw itself was like that. Um, it no longer is, but it has a beauty in a completely different type of way. It's the, the rate of change was like staggering. Like I would walk to work and, you know, in the space of, you know, months, you'd see 
skyscrapers flying up all around you and um they have a lot more f- like freedom to create those that sort of those sort of structures and things but um there is this real energy within the country to or at least the people i i met that they like to work really hard and then they like to really enjoy themselves and um i think it like i I think it all comes back to a lot of it's rooted in their very their very dark history that they've had um like th- throughout history uh Poland has, has seen a lot of difficult times but it, even in like the living memory of my colleagues they would remember living in communism up until like 1989 and so for many of them all this all these new kind of it, like experiences and brands coming into the countries and there's this just this uh i just felt like there was a real zest uh for life uh which was like amazing to be a part of i remember before i went there was um i remember reading something where uh, on a blog where someone had compared poland to brazil saying it was like the brazil of europe uh and i'd previously lived in brazil for three months and i brazil was like my favorite country in the world at the time i thought well if it's anything like that then it's got to be amazing and it seems peculiar because you think of poland being very cold and snowy and things and brazil being very hot but i think what they were talking about is more the life and the people and all those sort of uh sort of the warmth um that you have in both those countries and how were people towards you and a new product then? You know, I, I kind of see a bunch of old men going, what do you mean we're going to drink another kind of whiskey? We have our whiskey. Was it was it tough to sell them on, you know, on, on Chivas? It was, it was funny because there I was something like 24 or 25 or something, maybe younger. And um, I was often in front of men who were mid thirties, right up into their fifties. There I was talking to them about whiskey. Mm-hmm. And they, I think were looking at me thinking, who is this fresh fresh? Right, exactly. That's what I would think. <laughs> like, what, what, why does he think he can tell me about whiskey? Um, so, so I quickly went about rebranding myself. So I grew a beard, um, wow. which, I think made me look a fair bit older. I started buying like tweed jackets, uh, which I still have in my like cupboard somewhere and I don't get to use very often anymore. Um, so suddenly trying to make myself look older, uh, more credible. Um, and I think also being British, like I think gave me that sort of element of, uh, trustworthiness when talking about whiskey because obviously whiskey is from scotland um so i think those sort of things made it kind of people were you know excited to hear and like kind of liked the stories and um in in poland it's it's quite a great it's a really good market for whiskey because they about 90 percent of the the spirits market is vodka of course uh, and then the other 10 percent, or nine of the 10 percent, is whiskey they kind of really it's kind of all you've got to try and do is convince someone to move from drinking uh, vodka to whiskey um, and the exciting thing about it is it's actually very popular with young people which you don't see so often uh, in other markets when it comes to whiskey i think it's because the young people view whiskey as being this sort of sort of western uh like culture and things and uh and they love the sort of tales and the stories and so yeah no it was the people were very receptive to it yeah it's, i guess it's not what their parents are drinking if their parents are drinking vodka they're drinking exactly. something new yeah totally, totally. So, so you did you did that for a while you stayed there for a while yeah so i was there for uh just over two years yeah um I, like while I was there, I actually thought I I might never leave. I, I just loved the country so much. I loved the people. Like I had so many great friends. Like I remember the first like first two months were horrendous. Like I 
you know, barely spoke to anyone and uh, it was a very peculiar time. But suddenly there was this like shift and everything changed and then you would be meeting people all the time and all it took was, you know, one person to introduce you to, you know, their five friends and suddenly the like net would just grow and grow. Um, and yeah, it's it was it was a fantastic two years. Was it just, was it right after that that Monkey Shoulder came calling? No. So actually, I um, came very close to landing a different role with Shivers Regal, where uh, there was a moment when it was I was looking at becoming a brand ambassador for Shivers in South Africa. There was another brief moment where it was going to be Miami, uh, and then out of nowhere, it, I ended up moving to the UK, to their UK office to work uh, as a sort of, in a more sort of brand manager sort of position. Um, and here it was like very much an office role, but um, there was the suggestion of sort of travel and things like this. And um, it was kind of, I guess, a step up the ladder, uh, up the rungs. Um, so I did that for a year. And I think during that time, I sort of realized that what I really loved was being out there on the front line, seeing like real change happening sort of instantly and meeting a whole world of interesting people, uh, like really passionate, creative people. Like it really irritates me when I sort of see people either sort of talk down to bartenders or sort of suggest that bartenders are unskilled or that it's not like a real job or anything like that because for me bartenders are some of the most creative talented intelligent people like they often you know have a really great grip of maths and they because they manage like spreadsheets and have to run a profit at the same time they're coming up with like you know delicious drinks balancing flavors and all of this is in front of someone creating a show and like put, holding a conversation um and it's it being in front of those people was what i kind of guess i really love so that's yes yeah, so it's, it's definitely an ignor ignorant few because after yeah. interviewing people for four years i mean these are some of the brightest most interesting creative people i've ever met you know, so oh, yeah. that, yes, it would, it would make me crazy too. Thank goodness. I don't see that very often. <laughs> <laughs> and so where did you think that you were going to look for this, this role? Well, so, um, again, I, I took a similar approach to how I did, uh, initially, uh, -huh. uh because I, I, my contract at Shivas was actually running out. So I had kind of a bit of a time frame on this. Uh, but I was applying this sort of video application mechanic. Mm. Um, and so I applied to various different things, all with these like sort of personalized videos. And again, typically, like it's kind of the story of my life. But the night before the monkey shoulder roll <laughs> finished, uh, accepting applications, I spotted it and was like, oh, my God, this is like my dream brand, the dream role. And I remember thinking there's not, a hope in hell of them wanting to hire me but i was also like if i don't apply then i'll never give them the opportunity to say no right so i sort of threw my hat in the ring and and yeah fortunately they they came back to me and uh and interviewed me and and the interview process itself was quite bizarre i had to take them on a on a bar crawl through London. Um, and at the time I knew very little about the UK on trade and could barely string a handful of like credible bars together. Um, and so, yeah, I remember the week before that, just sort of going out every night, trying to like introduce myself to people being like, Hey, I'm a complete stranger. There's no need for you to know me, but, uh, what's your name? And uh, I might bring some people in here next week. Just be nice to them and me. Make me look cool. Um, so <laughs> obviously, it worked. You it charmed did. them. <laughs> yeah, fortunately, fortunately. And so, what? Tell me how it how it started. What was the like the first couple of things that you did? Yeah, so it was very much a baptism of fire. I 
my first week was London Cocktail Week. Um, what a week so, to start. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it, it was amazing because I would be meeting people and I would have no idea whether they were like colleagues, bartenders, monkey shoulder fans, or even just like kind of consumers rolling around London Cocktail Week. Um, and I, there was a very bizarre moment. I was in Kalukale one evening, got introduced to about 15 people at once. And um, the following day, one of them was sat in the office. And I remember looking at them thinking, this is very odd. What are they doing in the office? And I <laughs> then came to learn that they actually worked there as well. Uh, and weren't a bartender, as I had assumed. <laughs> All I've been told was, this is, this is Briny. You'll, you'll meet her a lot. And, and yeah, suddenly I discovered why. But, uh, um, and yeah, so London Cocktail Week was very full on. Um, I was just on a mission to sort of say hello to as many people as possible. Uh, again, quite daunting. So it was a bit like being in Poland. I kind of, only difference was everyone spoke English. But this time it was like, again, in a position where you kind of didn't know anyone. Um, and you, you, just needed to make as many friends as possible. But um, yeah, just kicked off with London Cocktail Week and and then it's now been two and a half years or so. Uh, and I feel very, I guess, very settled in the role. There's been a whole host of like fun and amazing experiences, which I don't think I could have ever imagined. Um, and yeah, I wouldn't change it. Wouldn't change um, it for the world. You, you said that... Th you know, when you saw Monkey Shoulder, uh, the, the application, this was like, oh my God, your dream job. What was it about it um, and about Monkey Shoulder? Obviously it's, you know, one of the most famous whiskeys now in the world, but what was it about, you know, that specific role or or the company that you thought, what, what made it the dream job for you? I always used to, say that monkey I, i'd be in tastings or trainings in poland and at the end bartenders or or guests would say go on tell us your favorite whiskey uh and you can't say shivers they'd they'd always caveat that and then i would often say some other perno ricard whiskeys and they'd be like no 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 you can't, you can't just you can't say some other perno ones what's your actual favorite and i would always say monkey shoulder um i remember the first time i drank here i, I don't recall the name of the bar, but it was up in Glasgow during this this training that we'd had uh, before moving out to Poland. And I remember looking at the sea of Scotch whiskies on the on the back bar and not really being confident to say any of the names. And then spotting Monkey Shoulder and saying, "Oh, I have Monkey Shoulder," and thinking it was delicious. And then one of my friends tells me like a few of the stories about the name and about its conception and things like this. And I thought this is super cool. Moving out to Poland, I would then just see Monkey Shoulder doing all these like fun, exciting things that were just like hilarious and a total uh, different approach to what I was used to. Um, and whenever I was setting up projects or running events in, in, in my Shivers world, I remember thinking, God, I really want to do it kind of like them, but how can I make it, you know, a shivasy way? So how can I, you know, at the time in Poland, it was like, how can I throw a tie and a tweed jacket on, on that? And, um, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, I just admired everything they did. And yeah, so when it came up, I thought, well, this is, this is incredible. It's going to be my favorite brand in one of the greatest uh, spirits markets in the world um, and I was like I just got, got to go for it and are you using your um, your video your your passion for video photography in your role now video kind of less so um, I've actually got more into into photo photography and sort of social media I sort of there's a lot of negative things about social media but I personally i kind of really love it uh i love um i love the how you can be creative with it and it's like a portfolio and it's kind of like a i used to do a lot of art at, 
at school and things. Um, and it was a real satisfaction in creating a painting or something. And there was this like physical thing you'd made. Um, and I guess since then I've realized that I'm a little bit too lazy to, you know, <laughs> I need a quicker gratification than painting a picture. Um, but I've discovered that, you know, photography kind of gives me that same sort of buzz uh, and often actually takes just as long. Um, but you, I get that sort of buzz out of it. Um, and it's as with the sort of job applications and getting those roles being so such a visual thing and that being so important, I found it to be such a like great tool in my role. So, um, yeah, I, I remember it all the passion for photography kind of really kicked off when, when, uh, there was a, there's a bartender called Callum Rickson who I, you might, might well have met, but he, he works, uh, in Bath, a place called the hideout. And I remember being there and he showed me the new iPhone and, and how it had this portrait mode. Um, and it just blew my mind. I was like, this is incredible. This, the pictures you can take with this is just next level. So next week I decided, okay, time had come. I was going to treat myself to my first like phone contract. Um, and, and or went out and got one the following week. I showed it to like a, another brand ambassador in our team and she did the exact same. And I quickly realized that, you know, surely everyone is going to very quickly be leveling up their sort of camera phones. So, you know, why don't I try and learn how to use this camera that I've had sat in a cupboard since I was at university uh, to actually start taking sort of some, some more interesting or, or more unique pictures. Um, and so, yeah, I just went around sort of teaching myself through the university of YouTube. Um, and yeah, it just became something that was very pleasing. People seem to really like it and, and it's, it's really helped my, my role. And, and we now do a thing at William Grant's called, unwrapped where we go and give seminars uh, around the country on what we call the other side of bartending so rather than talking about how to make clear ice or how to how to clarify things or or the sort of techniques of bartending it's more a sort of holistic view of of uh, other sides of life so there's all sorts of different things i think you've had fab speaking previously about uh, adventure and creativity and things and my subject that I chose to talk to people about was the power of photography um, something that I call barography uh, and yeah it's, it's now become like a personal passion of mine to try and help as many people become better photographers to be able to take great pictures of the delicious drinks we make the beautiful bottles we buy and, and the people we live and work with yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll have to follow some of your tips because I know that you've given a couple of chats with the booze brain and um, and also, you know, I saw online with at least up on SoundCloud and uh, I think there's a YouTube video of you doing it for the company as well. Yeah. In how? Yeah, there's a few places. Yeah. So few people can learn. Funny. Well, back to Monkey Shoulder. If someone is new to Monkey Shoulder whiskey and they're taking their first dram, I've had it before and I will be taking the dram after. Um, what is the experience that you want them to have? Oh, it's an interesting question. I, th I just hope that they find it to be delicious. Um, we, we actually very rarely um, drink it neat. Um, I think it is a delicious whiskey when it is drunk neat it is a i know i uh, love it neat a blend of three single malts it like really stands up on its own um but i think it really comes into its own when you mix it in cocktails uh, so normally when i do like a tasting or a training we sort of skip the drinking and eat and we jump straight into various different cocktails and you can we play around with how it works really well in a stirred down boozy drink and it works equally well in like a a long, light, refreshing cocktail and, and how it can sort of transcend categories. So, you know, there's lots of people who think, you know, there's a pocket of whiskey drinks, there's a pocket of rum drinks and so on. Um, and what we try to do is show that monkey shoulder can 
can bridge those gaps and you know why not make like a monkey shoulder colada um or or basically the possibilities are kind of endless really i love that idea of a monkey shoulder colada it's next level like and we we, <laughs> we it's, it's li- genuinely like oh my god i there's nothing better but it's <laughs> <laughs> but um in fact there's one thing better we we've we recently brought out a i say recently it's actually it's actually probably like two years ago now but we we brought out a uh a second variant of monkey shoulder called smoky monkey um which you can find in the uk and france and um slowly it'll, it'll it will sort of spread its wings um but if you make the monkey colada with smoky monkey oh my god so good Oh my god! I may have to have that as a recipe. Yes, I'll, I'll, all I'll right, get all it. Right. <laughs> now, if we were at the bar, I'd say let's go get that at the bar. Unfortunately, we're separated thanks to a certain virus that we have right now. So I will join you the next time we're both in a bar together and have one of those. How's that? Definitely sounds all like right, a sound plan. good. All right, yeah. all right. Thanks so much. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks so much to John for sharing his story with us. He leaves us with a very monkey shoulder esque take on the old fashioned, plus a second cocktail of the week that changes up any idea you might have about the pina colada. Our cocktail of the week is a batch cocktail recipe, which means you're making more than one at a time. And it'll make every day an old fashioned day. It's the monkey shoulder lazy old fashioned. Take a whole bottle of monkey shoulder and pour out 100 mils from your bottle into a glass. Enjoy this spare whiskey later anytime you like. But now, pour 90 mils of sugar syrup back into that same bottle, then add 30 mils of Angostura bitters also back into the bottle. Shake it carefully and store in the fridge. When it's chilled, you're ready to pour 12 old fashions over ice. And then garnish each of them with an orange zest. For the next cocktail of the week, the Monkey Colada and its sister, the Smoky Monkey Colada, you'll have to head to LushLifeManual.com where you'll find this recipe, more whiskey recipes, and all the cocktails of the week, plus links to where you'll find all the ingredients. Why did I ever think I would make a lemon drizzle cake during lockdown days? I've never even made a cake. It wasn't toilet paper I longed for during the first days of the lockdown, but flour. And this idea of making a lemon drizzle cake? When I'm so much more interested, and always have been, in making a lemon drizzle cocktail, or two or three. So now I'm left with loads of baking ingredients. So if anyone is interested, just email me. If you live for Lush Life, make sure you are giving back to the bars you love by donating or taking part in cocktail delivery where you live. Theme music for Lush Life is by Stephen Shapiro and used with permission. And Lush Life is always and will be forever produced by Evo Terra and Simpler Media Productions. Which leaves me to say the wise words of Oscar Wilde, all things in moderation, including moderation, and always drink responsibly and wash your hands and stay safe. Next week, our guest has risen through the ranks to be in charge of a bar in one of the swankiest private clubs in town. And although he tells me he's shy, he had no problem revealing what got him to where he is now. Until that time, bottoms up.